Okay, I believe we are live. Um, and we will just hold on for like another one minute to allow people to come online. And we'll get started with what's going to be a very interesting conversation, in my opinion. Um, really looking forward to this. Um, yes. Let's go live. We want to get us started on time. We want to end on time. Thank you, everyone, for joining today's webinar. Um, we're having a conversation about learning machine learning. And even before jumping into learning machine learning and the buzzwords around data science and AI, um, it is really quite important we have a strong foundation of, first of all, problem solving, um, even identifying problems and maybe even a software engineering background. I have with me today, um, Celestine Omin. I'm gonna allow him to do the honors of introducing himself. But if you're watching this on YouTube, please subscribe. Okay, I think it's on this side. Um, and then also click the bell to get notified about other upcoming videos. We'll be streaming probably every Friday or every Saturday. Um, and right now we're gonna dive straight in and ask Celestine for a brief introduction of himself and his journey into software engineering in general. Okay. So Lesson, over to you. All right, thanks, Anjali, thanks for having me. Uh, welcome everyone to this, um, to this webinar. My name is Celestin. I run a company called Alta Labs. We are pretty much a software engineering consulting company. We do a ton of work for a couple of startups, um, some of the ones that you know and uh, in the industry. We have been doing that for uh, a couple of years, well, well over a year now, and it's been an interesting journey. Um, so for me, prior to signing up Alta Labs, I used to work as an engineering manager at Paystack. Then uh, I spent about two years working as a technical consultant. Then prior to Andel, I used to work at a company called Conga. Um, so yeah, that's about myself in, the, in a nutshell. I have a CS degree um, from the rest of Calabar, so that's it. Maybe you're muted, so I, I can't hear you. Thank, thank you for that very brief um, but detailed background. Um, I think uh, I followed your career over the last eight to 10 years, a very impressive. And I think one thing that stands out for me is some of the challenges you had to encounter in various roles. And even now that you're into consulting, you're, 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 you're going to be involved in different businesses in different domains. And in mm -hmm. delivering value or delivering solutions to these businesses, the first thing is even understanding what is the business objective, what is the value, what problem are you trying to solve? That's usually the perennial question you ask all businesses or startups. When you engage technology, engage engineering, or even think of engaging artificial intelligence and machine learning, what problem are you trying to solve? So quickly going into AI and ML, I'm gonna ask you a question mm -hmm. that is sort of like two in one, which is how do you, understand artificial intelligence or machine learning and, and how have these sort of reflected in either products you've used on the consumer side or maybe engineering tasks you've had to automate or even just appreciated the amount of engineering that goes into some of the most amazing apps that, that we use every day like like search uber and stuff like that okay all right um thanks so well Interesting thing is that in the course of my work, I haven't had to do anything AI or ML related. Um, that's because I don't really have a solid grasp of it. Um, I think if I would, I mean, there was a project, there's a project that we're having potentially to work with. Um, if that comes through, then we'll have to use any of the off the shelf uh, services from either Google Cloud or AWS, for instance. Um, I think that's the first thing. Um, but I, 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 as a consumer, I have been impressed with the improvement with regards to like artificial intelligence and machine learning in general for the last couple of years. Um, I'm a parent. Um, for those who follow me on Twitter, I talk about my kids every now and then. And Google Photo for me is one of the most brilliant products that Google has built that has really maximized um, machine learning. So for instance, Google does this thing where it sort of creates a video layered with some really nice um, background music of your child's progression, like from the first day of birth to like maybe the current age. 
Uh, I think three weeks ago or thereabouts, I woke up to a video that Google Photos had made for me. And it was, uh, it was emotional on so many different levels because I could see his progression from like the first day he was born up, up to like, you know, a couple of weeks ago this year. And just watching him grow, that for me, it was a tearjerker. And uh, I am quite grateful for those kinds of products. It sort of humanizes technology every now and then. I think for me, that's one of the most beautiful things, you know, about it. Um, then Google Maps also is one of those tools that I pretty much rely on every now and then, especially when I'm in a very different terrain that I haven't been before. Uh, just ability to know that when you punch in, you know, um, two locations on a map, you would get almost near accurate results as to like, from traffic to how you can find your way around those places. So uh, from a consumer perspective, that has been some of my best interaction with some products. Um, and there are a couple of other products uh, that are out there, but I think from my two favorite ones, uh, Google Photos, I mean, I mean that, uh, and then Google Maps. I, I do a lot of, uh, a fair amount of walking around. Yeah, very impressive. Um, I think we're getting to the point where it is very, very obvious that when a machine learning product, when a, when a product that we, we obviously, you know, the poster child of machine learning product appeal to you, they appeal to you not necessarily because of all the algorithms of all the calculus, all the calculations at the back of the product, but what the product actually does for you, either emotionally or if this was a business, how, what business value it delivers to you. Every business, I hope, <laughs> every commercial business I know, is out to make money. And the usual cliche is you identify a problem, you solve a problem, you scale your solution, you make a lot of money, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah. um, machine learning has been there, artificial intelligence has been around for what, 40, 50 years, right? And has recently exploded with the internet and with data and with powerful computing. But we've got corporations, we've got businesses, we've got retail businesses that have been solving problems, delivering value for customers, earning trillions of dollars way before machine learning, or actually way before machine learning became a buzz over the last four, five, six years. Mm -hmm. How do businesses, how do you think technology, software engineering has been providing insights for small businesses, big businesses, Fortune 500 companies, investment banking, prior to, say, 2015, prior to 2010, right? How have we been, and even till today, we've got big businesses at home and abroad that are able to query their data, their customers, and deliver solutions. I do remember one of your blog posts about the pharmacies, and if it's something you want to link to, but please tell me how are businesses doing this, and how come this AI or ML new tool or new buzzwords uh, hasn't been there and people have been making money or solving problems? I, I think for me, it comes down to like, what's the primary thing with which you're trying to grow as a business? Um, are you here to sort of experiment with technologies or are you here to make money? Um, being in consulting over the last maybe two years or thereabout has really showed me that look, um, in most cases, the customer doesn't really care about what the underlying technology he or she just wants to solve problems for themselves. Um, I'll take it to an example. Um, good thing you talked about my article, so let me even come back to that article. I spent maybe the first four years of my really strong professional career uh, working for an e-commerce company. And, and there are things that we did then that wasn't necessarily machine learning, and we could see some massive um, output with regards to that. Um, one of the most interesting story was a case where uh, we found out that a couple of users um, hadn't just quite, you know, come back to shop with us as a company. So we spent this much money to acquire the customer, and after like one or two shopping experiences, that was that was it. They didn't come back. So one, how do you bring back those people into uh, the shopping funnel? How do you keep them? How do you engage them? And for me, uh, or for us at the time, it wasn't just a case of machine learning. Every single time somebody was buying something, we could keep track of this information. What did you buy? When did you buy it? At what point did you buy it? You know, so 
if we could rerun a simple query on our system that says, give us all the customer that hasn't shopped with us in the last three months. And we found a bunch of people that hadn't shopped with us in the last three months. And we sent them, I remember vividly, we sent them 750 Naira uh, gift card. Now, we had, if my memory serves me right, almost about 60, 70% conversion rate. So people came back to shop with those gift cards. But the beautiful thing was that they weren't just shopping for items worth 750. They shopped way more than that. And the 750 was just an icing on the cake. Now, because we now monitored again, those people now became repeated customers over the next couple of months. Now, here's what that did. If we had invested that 750 Naira across, let's say, 1,000 people into some billboards, honestly, I don't think we would have had these people coming back. I don't think so. But because we gave people this money, because we knew them, we knew their shopping history, and we gave them this money, it became one of two things. One, it was a, it kind of surprised that, oh, wow, I com this company thinks well of me and wants me to come back, and they're giving me free money to incentivize me to come back. Then people started tweeting about it. So that built like some sort of uh, uh, a snowball effect where somebody said, oh, wow, this company gave me some of the Oh, that's interesting. And people are now asking, oh, wow, when, how, why? I know all of these kinds of questions. So we unconsciously set this whole domino effect of people just coming back to us with very minimal effort from our own end. So I think for me, that was one of the most beautiful applications of information learning. The second part was just in a case where people come in and browse randomly and add stuff to their cards and just went away. Um, when people add things to their cards, you can see what they're adding, when they added it, and what kind of things they added. So we did something where if you had an abandoned cart every three days, you know, just take an email and say, hey, you still have this item on your cart. Do you want it? Do you want it? You know? And we realized that by just doing that, we had about 20% conversion rate. Now, these were people that probably would never have come back. These were you know, sales I would have lost or something. And for us, that was really beautiful. There wasn't any fantastic magic behind the scene. There wasn't any, you know, we're expanding GPUs or CPUs, you know, we're not training any model. We're just querying the simple data that we had. Um, then I think recently, last year also, uh, I had a friend who reached out to me and was asking questions around, um, you know, his kid, uh, I think his child was in the teething phase and the child was crying through the night. And I said, oh, well, okay, we've been here before. This is what we did you know, when we wherever you are today. Now that got me thinking, as a new parent or as a parent, for instance, I doubt if there's a parent here that hasn't have to deal with some sort of uh, the medical industry, either the pharmacies or the hospital itself. Wouldn't it have been nice if this pharmacy, for instance, that you work with, knew you to a point where they can tell what need for a shifting parameter. If I made, if I'm if I walked into a pharmacy and I was buying a diaper for zero to three months old, I mean that should give the pharmacy an idea that this is either a new parent or an expecting dad. Then by like maybe months five or thereabouts, I expect the pharmacy to tell me, oh okay, we suspect that your child should be at this milestone. So this is what you probably would be looking at for, you know, this milestone. Um, these are the allergies that you should expect in this milestone. These are the things that you should expect in this milestone. If you see X, Y, Z symptoms, you should be worried. If you see this, this is normal. You don't have to be worried about it. Um, so this is just businesses making use of data without necessarily machine learning to like make the life of their customers really good and really easy. And the beautiful thing about this is that this unconsciously begin to build some sort of loyalty between these customers and this brand. Because we will always implicitly trust people that have our best interests at heart, people that think well of us. I mean, that's why some people have some sort of brand affiliation and some brand loyalty. So for me, it came to that point. If, for instance, I was buying, you know, uh, a drug or a syrup for my child, I mean, the, the pharmacy should know that this child automatically is within this age band. And they should be able to tell me, okay, this is what you need to do at most, this at most, that, even up to the point of like suggesting immunizations for the kid, um, even though they won't be the one offering the immunization services. But I mean, they could do that as a value added service. 
And guess what? Whenever my child has an issue, guess what I'm going to call for? It's the pharmacy because I feel like they technically or partially have our own medical records. So I think for me, this is one of the easiest things and low-hanging fruits that businesses can begin to do. And this is not just for pharmacies alone. It cuts across different industries. If you run like a fashion shop, for instance, how can you apply this to yourself? Um, if you ran like a, uh, a butchery, for instance, what, how can you apply this to your business? It's like, how can you apply all of these sorts of things? And these data are given to us freely by people every single day. So I don't see the reason why companies can't have access. So the summary is that you almost always do need machine learning to do all of this. Like with just simple things, you can get stuff, stuff done for yourself. So that's it. Absolutely, absolutely. I think it, it is it is so clear that um, we we need to we need to have a very 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 clear problem solving culture. Yes. ML AI are tools, adequately advanced tools. And then there's this hilarious meme which I have put up on my and which you know people have shown me. We've talked about a lot. I, I mean, it made it made a lot of waves when it got posted on some groups where. Newbie programmers, a lot of beginner programmers are hearing about the buzzwords, you know, blockchain, cloud, and machine learning, artificial intelligence. And they skip all the rudimentary things that always apply, which is, first of all, even a problem solving culture. Then yeah. you start talking about, um, you know, the basics, algorithms, data, data structures. How do you even know that you have the right data or the wrong data? How do you, what kind of data science, what kind of analytics do you want to do? You know, when you start going into machine learning and the AI, it's a lot about things about intelligent systems, about predictions. You know, I, I had a, a, a interesting conversation this morning about, you know, people saying, oh, no, AI and ML is so important. Look at all the loan apps that are out there today. They're using AI and ML to adequately predict. I'm like, banks have been 30, 40 years. You can't tell me that without AI or ML, banks cannot give loans. And then even with the AI and ML products, you still have people defaulting loans or you still have loans being given the wrong way, or people who are recommended to buy or to be given a loan, and then they go ahead, collect the loan, and then they don't pay back. So sometimes if you're, in quotes, trying to predict the behavior of your existing customer, you don't necessarily need some intelligence recommender system to tell you. I mean, a lot of the AI, um, uh, the machine learning output is you get a model, that is based on existing data that you have yeah. thoroughly analyzed and you use that to sort of predict what actions or what decisions to make on data you have not seen, right? That yeah. is one way to understand and, and I, I can make a couple of references, I'll put a couple of links there yeah, about framing a machine learning problem. So like you said, you walk into a business, you are a customer of that business. I've told you who I am, my age, I buy one product. If you can't figure out between you and I, that I have a baby and I live around you, yeah. and I probably will be changing what I'm going to be buying over three months, six months. Now. Uh, I'm not sure there's any tool that any programmer, especially a newbie programmer or someone just getting started, can just open up his laptop and create a solution for that business. So I think one thing I want to take a step back and just generally ask you, and this is for those who are on the machine learning, AI, you know, data science journey. The fundamentals are crucial. And you've had your own, you said you had a CS degree. I, I would be very impressed. I don't think so if your CS degree provided all the foundations and the backgrounds you needed. But in now working in e-commerce, payments, in a consulting business, now running your own consulting business, whether it's DevOps, whether it's UX, whether it's UI, whether it's AI, or whether it's ML, what are those basic fundamentals for building an engineering career. So even if it's AI, what are what am I supposed to you? Or how do you think um, you have sort of grown in your career following first principles? Okay. Um, I think for me, the first thing is ability to think logically. Um, logic is, is, is super important. I can't even overemphasize how much you should be able to think logically. Um, given a certain number of parameters, how can you deduce something from out of it? Um, so logic is super important. You can't just skip it. Um, the second thing is just problem solving. 
Um, how, do you, how do you approach problems? Me. Do you approach problems from a very binary fashion? Or do you cast a wider net and see how much you can think and come up with when regards to solving problems? Um, I have heard people say things like, oh, you need to be really good at mathematics for you to be a software engineer. No, I don't think so. Um, I like to think that computers are one of the things that you can relate to like in everyday life. It's practical stuff that we can see every single time around us. So for me, I would categorize it in three ways. Um, one, um, logic. Two, problem solving and just curiosity. Now let's bring logic first and foremost to bear. I have a younger brother who lives with me. And if I give my younger brother a thousand naira and say, go buy me two bottles of Coke. If you see meat pie, buy two, then come back with the change. Now that is logic, that is a sequence. That is how computer thinks. So the first thing is I give him money, he goes to the shop, he hands them the money, and says, I want two bottles of coke. Now, he gets the two bottles of coke. The other condition is if there is meat pie. So if there is no meat pie, then he can come back home. Now, if there is meat pie, feel free to buy it. But there's also something else that I didn't explicitly have to tell him. There's a company of, can this money cover this request? What if after buying two bottles of coke, he saw only the money can cover one extra meat pie? Should he buy? Shouldn't he buy? Like, that's how you make decisions. And for me, that is one of the best ways you can start, you know, getting yourself involved in how to think how computers work. Basically, if you really want to be a good software engineer, then you have to, like, know how to think logically. Secondly, also, um, I think there's a place for curiosity. You have to be curious enough to be able to ask questions. Why is this? Thing? Why? How, how does this work? Why doesn't it work this way? Why is this happening this way? Now, as a software engineer, I feel like 90% of what you're going to be doing is asking the whys and a couple of ifs every now and then. So um, today we're building you know, a wealth management software for a client uh, that will remain unnamed for the moment. And uh, one of the things that people do is invest in, you know, financial instruments, be it stocks, mutual funds, bonds, all of those sorts of things. Now, the first thing that we do is that if a person sees an, an instrument and they want to you know, invest in it, so we check, do they have enough money to cover you know, the spotches? Yes, if they do, fine. Do they, does the spotches have some sort of commission to it? Yes, if it has commission, then charge it to it. If you charge and you can get value for that charge, then you know, allow them go through. If they can't get, if, if you didn't get value for that charge, then you know, step back and tell them you didn't get value for the charge, and that's, and that's how computers work. There is no other way about it, that's it. I think the other thing is just understanding the language of the computer. You and I are speaking today on this platform, but that's a basic fundamental language. Um, it could be any programming language, you know, there are tons of them, Python, C++, you know, C Sharp, all of the sorts of tech. Pick one of them and understand them. Then the other part is just like be curious, always ask questions, keep probing and ask questions. You will never stop asking questions as a computer engineer or a computer scientist or a software programmer or whatever you choose to call it. The day you start asking questions, I think that's the day like you stop growing. And don't be don't be scared of you know hard problems. Um, because the only way you can grow as an engineer and build muscle memory is that if you keep solving hard problems. I told a few colleagues uh, the other day and they said, look, the difference between a senior engineer and a junior engineer is that the senior engineer has put much in a couple of hard problems that you have never dealt with. That's why he has grown or she has grown all of this muscle memory such that if they ever encounter this problem in the future, it's quite easy for them to solve it. So in summary, logic, problem solving, and curiosity. Absolutely, logic, problem solving, and curiosity. Um, we're gonna take a little bit of a detour and, and ask you a little bit about your own stack, your own specialty, like day in the life of a problem solving engineer like Celestine. Maybe what tools do you use? What kind of notebook do you use? What you know sort of infrastructure platforms do you use? 
when you dive into things like SQL, do you do these things on the cloud? Do you do them online? Do you use any tools on AWS or Google, like you know, BigQuery? Are you running my SQL directly on your laptop? In this your sort of even experimental, you know, curiosity sort of workflow, can you can you can you tell us what it, it feels like when you get a brief? Uh, and then what sort of those what are those tools and even like what are sort of like the either the languages or stacks that, that, that come to you? That you rely on. Okay, so I, I think the first thing um, when we get a brief is just to analyze the problem. What kind of problem are we solving, um, and for what industry are we solving this problem for? Different industry requires, you know, different kind of briefs. If you're working in an e-commerce related project, for instance, you understand that one of the biggest things is going to be search. So how do you choose your a database that can support really solid search? Um, that can do like full text search and all of those sorts of things. Uh, so, you know, in those kind of cases, you want to go with elastic search, for instance. So that's it. Um, how do you store the data? Um, is this data going to be cold? Is it going to be warm? You know, um, so if you're doing like the cold data, are you going to be storing it in like uh, AWS Glacier? Um, then, if you're querying those data, what kind of tools are you using querying them? Um, like, uh, GCP has BigQuery, for instance. How do you query it? You know? So those are the kind of things we do. Um, for me, day to day is I work on the backend system. Um, I cannot design to save my life, um, so I enjoy working on the backend system. It's the it's the nonsense. <laughs> part. I have to you to laugh. <laughs> it's the non-sexy part of engineering. It's like uh, I like to tell people it's like in the, an auto mechanic workshop. The panel beaters will get more glory because they do the shiny body work than the guy that works on like the brain box, you know, stuff. So, so. But we, we know that it's not like one is we all come together. But um, for me, I think that's our specialty. At work, when I'm deploying, for instance, we are a big fan of infrastructure as code. So when I were using GCP or AWS or Digital Ocean, for instance. We try to script our infrastructure. We don't manually build them from like command line or console. Um, so we use uh, Terraform for doing that. Um, why Terraform is because we can easily swap um, any of the cloud providers as opposed to using a particular vendor tool. So we can swap from like Azure to GCP to AWS, you know, very quickly. And it also allows us to build like repeatable, consistent infrastructure if we have to do that 10,000 times. Um, we deploy with a tool called Ansible. Um, Ansible allows us to do configuration management. So installing stuff, you know, pulling stuff from different places, um, installing things like on NPM, all of those sorts of things. Um, so that's, that's pretty much what we do. Um, we push every single thing to Slack. Um, that way, uh, every other team member is aware of what's happening. Um, and we're also a big fan of uh, CCD. So uh, the test has to run properly. It's, was the test broke or wasn't it broke code before we push the production? Um, all of those sorts of stuff. On our local machine, we work with Docker. Um, that way we can sort of build reproducible environments that simulate what production and staging will look like. That way we don't ever run into the problems of, oh, it works on my machine, it doesn't work on, me. <laughs> on, the, on the staging of production. So, um, Docker allows us to you know, navigate that kind of stuff. I, as a person, um, I live and swear by to-do lists. Um, without a to-do list, I am pretty much useless. So before I begin my day, I have a bunch of stuff that I have in my to-do list. So I use Microsoft to-do um, to sort of uh, you know, put together what I want to do. Um, if you look behind me, there's a white board on my wall. Um, I think better when I write on the board. So I have a whiteboard in my in my study, so I, I have to write on the board. Even, even if I'm just the only one solving that problem, I think clearly when I write, and I enjoy writing, writing on the whiteboard. So I write on that whiteboard. I sketch things on paper before I even begin to solve them. Then I use Evernote um, for research. So we don't just, I don't just, we don't just see a problem and dive into that problem. So we research the problem. Has this been done before? Who did it? How did it? What are the pitfalls? What are the things that we have to, you know, watch out for? Are they blind sites or blind spots that we have to be, you know, cognizant of? So I, I do that a whole lot. And I use Evernote to do like my research and write and 
do all of those sorts of things. Uh, so that's pretty much a day in the life of Celestin um, with regards to work. Absolutely, absolutely very, very insightful. Um, I One other question. You want to pick up a new technology, books or videos? Oh, videos. Um, videos. <laughs> yes, videos. I, I am a very lazy... So I am a very lazy reader. Um, I, I, I feel like videos are, one, interactive. You can hear... Yeah, technically interactive because you can hear the speaker talk and think in real time. You can hear the teacher talk and think in real time. Um, so videos for me any day, any time. There's an advantage that a video has that books doesn't have. For books, you have to have this laser-like focus for you to make sense or in most cases drive value out of it. Videos, on the other hand, don't tell my wife this. I do my best learning when I'm eating. So I am a slow eater. I eat for like an hour for a meal. Um, while I'm eating, I am watching a video. Um, that way I can pause, rewind, pause, rewind, pause, rewind, pause, rewind. Um, then I have a notebook beside me. So I have this notebook beside me. I take notes from here. I am still old school, so I learned to write. Um, so that's for me, it's how I learn a new thing. Um, and for me to sort of crystallize that learning, I try to do like a toy project with that new knowledge. Um, it's nothing, I'm not necessarily being paid for it. So maybe I'm learning a new programming language. Um, so I built something toyish with it, maybe an API or something, and just you know put that knowledge into use. Um, and for me, another reason why I like video is that I can store this video and learn it on the way. I mean, maybe I'm being driven, I can sit at the back of the car and just you know, plug in my headphones and go through the videos over and over and over and over again. And um, I think pictorially, um, I don't know if there's a word for that. So I can, with almost near precision, recall scenes in videos that I have seen. So it just works for me. So that's that's the best way that I learn. We have a question from Damilola Olutoke. He says, so in your journey so far mm -hmm. dealing with data, which of the cloud platform works for you best? Microsoft Azure, GCP, or AWS cloud platform? Usually controversial okay. kind of question. But yes, this is software experience yeah. you know, from a practitioner. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I think for me, it's not about which is best or which isn't. I think it comes down to which that we have the most experience with. Um, so historically, we have a ton of experience with AWS. Um, so our default will always go to AWS. Um, and in recent times, we are beginning to see other tools that other practitioners or other service provider provide that works well for. So for instance, we are tending to like Google Scheduler for our schedule jobs these days uh, because Google just does, it's Google. This kind of thing better than Google. So I think for us, that's how we make decisions. It's not about you know which is best or which is not. It's just come down to which one that we that, uh, which one of these tools you know solves the problems for us more based on the level of experience we have. The last thing you want to happen to you as an engineer is for a problem to break out and you just to know how to solve it because you experiment with something new. So that's that's the decision. That's what guides the decision for us. Awesome. Um, we have a comment from someone here who is quite familiar, and I'm going to show his comments. So you were you were struggling with the pictorially. He says you think visually. Thank you, Oo. <laughs> okay. Oh yeah, I think visually. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. So uh, I, there's a question that has come up in previous episodes, and and I'm just hoping that even maybe some of those people uh, and, and by the way let me even switch to my my screen right now so for those of you who are watching this video or for those of you who are live or have watched some of our the first or the second edition of the webinar um there are a few things we're working on right now one is we are compiling all the questions we have received first of all the questions we receive on Slido, and secondly also the questions that we receive um even during the chat and what we are trying to do is make sure we provide answers to all those questions. So we will either answer those questions in something as simple as a spreadsheet. We already do have a spreadsheet that we are compiling those questions. Or in 
future editions when we speak to different speakers will give you more insights about some of the questions that we are asked. Um, two questions I'm going to bring up, and I'm just going to talk about them and then say a few things so that Celeste can come back and answer those questions. One of them is the mentor-mentee relationship. Um, so most people say, I'm learning data science, I'm learning cloud, I'm learning machine learning, I need a mentor, where can I get a one-on-one -on -one mentor to guide me through? So mm -hmm. Celeste, just take note of that. One of the questions that I'm going to ask you is, how did you find mentorship? Um, how do you even deal with all the requests to uh, be people's mentors? And um, who, who, who's even mentoring you right now? Like, in, 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 the, in the edge case that you don't find a mentor, is that the end of the growth of your career? So that's one question around mentorship. The second one that comes around is people talking about how do I get projects? How do I get my first job? And, and, and you've alluded to that doing a side project. So I'm going to ask you to do a little more and I would sort of contextualize this for those who are into machine learning specifically or data science specifically. But how do you gain experience? How do you gain portfolio? How do you gain credibility such that you, you either have experience as someone that has done some projects or when you're going for your first job as a junior engineer, a junior data scientist, um, people can allow you to take one foot into the door. So those are the two questions uh, I'm going to talk about. Uh, I would like, I'll hand over to Celestin to answer. And then uh, before we go on, I'll switch to a slightly more di a different topic about Google's machine learning crash course for those of you who may not know about it. Celestin, so, over to you. Okay. Um, so with regards to the mentor-mentee relationship, um, so there are two ways you can go about this. Um, sorry, I have a three-year-old who is banging on my doors. Forgive me. Um, so with regards to mentor-mentee relationship, first and foremost, um, you have to, if you're looking for a mentor, um, first and foremost, you have to be understanding the fact that people are super busy with their lives and nobody owes you anything. Um, you have to understand that. Um, then, how do you approach people? You just don't go to people and say, um, I want you to be my mentor, okay? Why? But it will make more sense if you come to somebody and say, hey, I am on this path. I am learning this. These are the things I have done. These are the problems that I'm dealing with. Um, at your spare time, I would appreciate it if you can you know, get on a Zoom call with me for 30 minutes and explain this to me. I guarantee you, you would have a lot more positive response than just going to people and say, I want you to be my mentor. Like, nobody's gonna do that. Um, nobody's gonna do that, you know, so just don't worry about that part. Um, so that's one. Secondly, also, most of the people that I see that come up to me, personal experience of wanting to be mentees, are people that are, maybe if I want to be better with glory, and want the glory immediately. These people seem to forget that, like, wherever I, maybe I am today, or any other person in my position, it didn't happen overnight. I started doing this thing since 2003. This is 17 years of blood, sweat, and tears. You know, so like, understand that it's gonna take time. Understand that it's gonna take a while. So don't come in thinking you're gonna get, uh, I hate using the word fame and fortune. Like, don't come in and thinking you're gonna get to this person's place overnight. It's not possible. Um, and also have some semblance of roadmap for yourself if you're looking for a mentor. This is where I am in my career. This is what I want. This is where I want to be in the next 12 months. How can I get there? People who are more willing to help you and guide you through that journey. I would say, okay, do this, do this, do this, do this. And also be polite. And I have asked for mentorship from people that I have never met before and I will never meet before. I use Twitter a whole lot. I have DM you know, engineers and engineering leaders and companies like Google, Twitter, Facebook, Google. And I guarantee you, people almost always give me the time because I know how to frame my requests. Secondly, how do you get on projects when you pretty much don't have some sort of credibility? 
it's very easy to hack it. Talk about the things that you're doing. Um, you have to learn to sort of move past imposter syndrome. It sounds easier said than done. I have been doing this thing for a while. I still suffer that, but I need to convince myself that I need to move past imposter syndrome. So what do you do? You write about the things that you do. You push things to GitHub. Those are one of the easiest places you can hack your career. In the early days of my career working professionally, I used to work at Conga. And almost every single time we did a major release, I would write about the products, write about the process, write about the learnings, the challenges, and all of the things that we had to deal with. Now, the reason why I did that was because one day, Jason tweeted that you know not too many people in Nigerian tech community shared whatever they were doing. Now, of course, I couldn't share about like the business details of the business of things, but I figured I could share about you know engineering. And because of that, I didn't set out to become a superstar or popular, but I just kept writing and I, I pissed myself. I, I, I set a target to write two articles every month. So in 12 months, I had like 24 articles. In two years, I had like 48 articles. And all of a sudden, people somehow believe that when it comes to e-commerce, I knew so much about it. And that was how I was able to move from one you know, job to the other. I have never written an application for a job, at least working for a Nigerian company. It's almost always somebody reaching out to me and saying, um, hey, we have seen what you've been doing. We want you to come you know, talk to us about these sorts of things. And this is not to brag, by the way, but like, this is one of the ways you can hack your career. Today, there are free code camp. Yes, you're learning HTML. Yes, there are 5,000 articles or 2 billion articles on HTML. Yes, you think, oh, another HTML article will not actually move the needle. That's not true. That is not true. Go and write about it. And for me, writing also is a way of journaling my journey. If I look at the articles I wrote six, seven years ago, they are very different from the articles I'm writing today. Today, I'm writing more of like the business part of things, not less of engineering, but business part of things because of where I sit or because of where I stand. So talk about what you do, write about it. If you're a designer, design stuff, put it on Dribble, share it on Twitter, share it on Facebook, share it on LinkedIn. Keep designing, keep pushing. How do you gain portfolio experience? Honestly speaking, open source. Open source is one of those places that has really democratized, you know, um, quickly building your portfolio experience. And people almost think that, oh, you have to be this level of experience to deal with open source stuff. No, that's not true. You could contribute in open source in anywhere whatsoever. It could be releasing an article. It could be, sorry, it could be writing an article about those open source projects. It could be contributing to documentation. It could be just looking at, you know, tiny issues you can fix. So there is a little bug somewhere that is being caused by a semicolon. You know, push a pull request to it. And if you do that consistently for six months to a year, you would have gained a ton of experience in that open source project. Laravel today has one of like, the biggest open source community. If you solve problems and you wrote libraries in the course of your job, push, you know, push it back to to Laravel community, push it back to packages and just, just let other people use it. Talk about that stuff. Never be ashamed of talking about the things that you do. That's something people have to learn to do. Like, never be ashamed of it. By the time a potential recruiter is talking to you, they won't be asking you so many mundane questions because they already know you have this level of experience in our passport. So that's it. And then I think you're muted, so I can't hear you. Very, very popular quote from um, John Resig, uh, the author of jQuery. Uh, many of you probably don't know what jQuery is or, or don't use jQuery. You're lucky. So those of you who can view things in a reactive way from one angle or the other, um, that's, 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 that's for you guys. But um, he says, when it comes to take a GitHub commit log over a resume, any day and this is what tweeted and it's been quoted in so many um places where people talking about how do you gain experience and this speaks directly to your um thing about first of all take open source seriously right you know go there start with like you know even if it's just semicolons or documentation and, and the same goes with machine learning a lot of machine learning libraries out there whether it's scikit learn whether it's even things that are more foundational like pandas they're, they're, they're all open source you can contribute to them you can 
you know, make changes to them. Um, I know people even in Nigeria who have done, you know, contributions to that. Uh, I know Wura, I know uh, Rising, who have also written libraries like Data East and Data Assist, right? And, and I think just from that point of view, when you want to reach out to somebody or when you're looking for that sort of machine learning part. So if you say, yes, you don't have a live project that you can point to. But if you can point to the fact that you've been contributing to libraries or SDKs, or even if it's just documentation or technical writing, or you've been blogging about your journey like you did, this is the ways you can stand out from the crowd. So um, I, I speak about this a few times, and I tell people a little bit about you know wanting to be spoon-fed, wanting to have some sort of entitlement mentality, you know, entitlement to your first job. You know, people say, eh, you know, there's this sort of like chicken and egg situation where you need experience to get a job but you need a job to get experience. And, and then they, they, they accept that narrative themselves for not having the opportunity to, to show themselves. And that's why either things are stacked against them or they're not friends with the best of the best or they don't have any, you know, like in Nigeria, connections, you know, to get the job. But like you said, GitHub, I mean, if, if, you, if you take a step back, I mean, um, I would, I would, go out on one limb and, and recommend a program like the HNG internship. You need to apply for such programs where you go, you learn, you code, and we're coming to community very soon. But then during such um, internships, you actually have to get things done. You actually have to learn how to you know, do a pull request. You, you actually have to learn how to fork a repo, make some changes, and then submit a pull request. You know, there are thousands of programs that are going with various communities, various learning environments, even from Google, even from the Facebook Developer Cycles program, you know, from Mandela, you know, even outside the shores of Nigeria, because I know this, this stream may be watched either in Kenya, South Africa, Ghana, and probably other countries. Um, you need to be able to find the easiest way to go on and at least make some tangible, reflectable progress. Um, first of all, writing about your journey, I think is enough. I wish I could write better. I wish I could make the commitment you made to write two articles a month that have like 48 articles uh, in two years. Um, but generally, if, if you don't do something deliberate and intentional to be visible, you definitely will find your career a bit more difficult. Um, in the machine learning space, globally you have cargo, locally you have, or not, not even locally, I'll just say regionally in Africa, even though it's a global platform, you have Zindi. Competitions are being released every day. On Dev Post, there are hackathons every day. Uh, so you, you need to find a way or you need to make a commitment to go on these platforms, go to the help section, do what works for you, read the documentation, buy a book about the platform or a PDF, or watch some of the how to get in started videos and do something and then create a public profile. So don't go to this profile, but you can check github.com slash and say that's mine. You can go to github.com slash cyberomi. If you take a course on Udacity, you can also create an external profile. On LinkedIn, you can list your projects. So if you don't list your projects and you don't get recognition and you don't get or land your first job, you can't necessarily blame the industry or the system because a lot of the cues on how to get your first project, how to get involved, um, there, there are gatekeepers when you're going to find a job in a specific company, but in a lot of other places, there are no gatekeepers, and the only gatekeeper that's stopping you from getting your first tangible gig is actually yourself or information you do not have. And speaking about information you do not have, Celestine, do you want to tell us a little bit about communities and where communities, GDG, GitHub Africa, For Loop, Andela, HNG, where have communities played a role in your growth? And at what point do you think people don't need to overcommit to every single meetup in every single field by every single community or content provider? Um, oh, yes. Um, I can't overemphasize the place of community in my career. Um, so the GitHub community has been, sorry, the um, GDG community has been very helpful. Um, I used to be a GDG manager in Calabar uh, until I moved to Lagos, so that's one place. Um, and also, I am a part of a handful of community. Um, today, I am part of some engineering leaders community. 
Um, and we use Slack to talk about, you know, the problems with which you're dealing with, you know, organizations and other sorts of things. Um, you can learn and grow in isolation. It's impossible. Um, can you learn in isolation? Yes, but your growth will be dependent on people. Um, so you go into a meetup, a meetup, for instance, you hear people talk about new experimentations, new libraries, new stuff, new discovery, and you pick a thing or two from there and come, you know, practice and just learn and learn better. There is, I am a firm believer in wisdom of the crowd. Like just hearing people's diverse opinions and thoughts on stuff, it's one of the easiest ways for you to like accelerate your career very quickly. And also, serendipitous, you know, introductions happen. I meet XYZ, he works for ABC, he does ABC, all of those sorts of things. There's a high likelihood of you to hear somebody say, oh wow, I am looking for a person that does ABC, XYZ, all of those sorts of things. I would tell something happened in 2010 or 11. It was one of those GAs that Guru held at, uh, what's it called now? At uh, Civic Center here in Lagos. I flew into that event by 3 a.m. that morning. I got into that event. Long story short, there was a, a competition to build a Chrome developer tool. I did, and I came first, and I got a phone. But that wasn't where the most interesting thing happened. In that event, I think I met Tima Kimbo. Uh, it's a really interesting guy, uh, quite big in the blockchain space. So I think I met Tim Akimbo in that place, and we got talking every now and then. And when Sim Shadaya was starting Conga, interestingly, Sim spoke to Tim that he's looking for, you know, young people who do this thing, and, you know, you should gather them for him. Tim reached out to, or Sim reached out to me because of the introduction that Sim did, and that's how I moved to Vegas. That's it. There's no other explanation around that. That's how I moved to Vegas. So I think for me, community is a very big part also. And also you contributing to community, don't just go there to take. Um, it's also super important. Learn to speak at events. Um, good, large communities, this is how breakout session. Put out a call, when there's a call for proposal, put out something, it doesn't matter. I would rather you put out a call for proposal and get denied than just don't put it out and you know, sell yourself short on that opportunity. Um, lastly, you don't have to join every single community. Um, you don't have to be in Angular community, React, Twitter, um, Facebook. Or, no, 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 you don't have to be. Depending on whatever you're doing, at every phase in your career, there's a community for it. Find that community, be involved in that community, and contribute to that community. If you spread yourself too thin, then you might never get a lot of value um, from any of those communities. Um, today, I pretty much am involved in communities that have to be engineering leaders because that's where I am in my career. And I'm focusing on that. So yeah, you need communities. And every now and then you're learning from people. So for instance, you will learn here from a, a, an engineering manager from Stripe telling you how they deal with people problem, how they deal with engineering problem. You're hearing experiences from people from like Venmo or Twitter or Facebook. So you need to be part of communities. And you just learn from just listening to other people. Okay. Um, so this question starts leading us back to our original premise leading us back to some information I would really, really love to share. And the question comes from Moran Dev. says, what drives you to achieve more or explore other tech? Um, I think for me, it's curiosity. Um, that's like the only single biggest factor um, that I can say curiosity. And also, I will be lying to you if I sit down and say money doesn't, it's not a factor. Money is also a factor because, I mean, the more you know, the more you earn. That's, a, that's how it works. But I think first and foremost, curiosity is like one of the biggest driving factors for me. So um, I'm curious about how things work, how do things, this kind of things. I want to explore, I want to think, I want to go behind the scene and see how these things work. And also, yeah, the money part also, it's great. So. Amazing. Um, I mean, so... And good you started with curiosity. I mean, I, I usually start with the money aspect. Like, okay, um, that's it. That's, it. that's a serious joke, but or oh, I'm jokingly serious. But um, uh, <laughs> yeah. But I think, uh, and I and I got this question very recently, and I was having a conversation, and I, I want to just give a, a little bit of a perspective. So one thing was, yes, how do you, how many, how many meetups 
in how many varying domains should you belong to. For me, I think at the early, early beginning of your career, whatever your motivation is, whether it's curiosity or money that says, I want to go into tech. At that point, offer yourself the perspective. You talked about how wide do people think, how far can you go, of exploring UX, UI, software engineering, DevOps, front end, back end. At the early stage of your career as a newbie, it is, I think, I would say perfectly okay. I would say it's okay to explore as many meetups, as many communities as possible, trying to figure out what you want. This is a two-edged sword because I, I think sometimes, for me, if I give opinionated advice, I always tell people to start with HTML, CSS, JavaScript, you know, and it's actually HTML, CSS, because that's sort of easy to encounter. You're going to come across a website and then start figuring things out and do a right click and do view source. And from there, you can start picking it up. Um, maybe these days, because I, I started, you know, like you said, you have like 17 years experience. I think we have like that same guy. I think mine's like almost 20 years in the business of that curiosity, the highs and lows. It is now, now they're mobile apps. So you, you pick up WhatsApp. We, we, we use Blackberry and Yahoo Messenger. And then you start figuring out how does this happen? You know, how does the blue tick appear? Why is the screen like this? You know, you pick up Uber and you see things rolling on a map and then you launch Google Maps on the other side and you see some things and they're quite similar. And then someone tells you that Uber uses the Google Maps API. So your curiosity can be sparked by all those things. And then just looking at that app, if you do a little bit of expertise, you find out that for that app to work, there's product management, there's back end, there's UX. There's so many disciplines that are involved. So in the beginning, it, if you're not very clear, it is okay to explore a couple of meetups, a couple of communities to sort of find what resonates the most with you. Um, the second aspect to that is um, someone asked a question like, how do you choose from all these other things? How do you choose a career in tech when you have all these multiple options? Especially when you now realize there are multiple options. And I said something that was a bit controversial and someone asked for a little bit more explanation. And I said, I said, let the career choose you. Right? And when I say let the career choose you, it means you can go somewhere to go learn React or you've been in a meetup and then you meet a team at Kimbo, he introduces you to his team, Sim says come and work in Conga. At that point, he might not say come and work in the front end working on the Conga website. They say come and work in Conga. Unless your stomach is full and you have a safety net and or you love our farm so much that in Calabar you don't want to come to Lagos, just allow the career put you on a plane or night bus and come to Lagos and land in Conga. When you are in Conga doing your work in Conga, you might start in the DevOps team and you might even still be attending React meetups in GPT Lagos or All Loop or Front Stack. And then if you now find out that you have a knack or a skill in another field, then you can easily approach the engineering manager or your manager or the founder of the company and say, you want to switch to this. Or if it's the buzzword or it's the money that is hot in ML and AI, and while you are doing product management in Conga, you are doing an Udacity Nano degree, and then the moment you now know that you know machine learning and AI, you can actually come with a business problem solution. So while um, uh, Celestine is telling you, hey, how so we're going to get our customers to reshop, you come back and say, I can run a script and throw this in BigQuery and run this in blah, 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 and here's how we have a recommender system or we are, we are filtering for transactions for our loan or for our credit management system or detecting fraud using if-else statements, but I can build a model based on our five-year history of fraudulent transactions and I can use machine learning, either using this API or this model I built and deploy it in the system and then you can now, in quotes, get into machine learning. So, so when I say let the career choose you, and, and, and I made a comment, when I was giving my explanation, I was like, I didn't study developer relations or developer advocates in university, right? I didn't even study computer science. But over time, I noticed that I was beginning to attend communities. I liked it. You know, um, I had previous, uh, the person in my previous role, the Mecca Figbo, we all looked up to him. Everybody wanted to work at Google. And we just continued attending meetups and, you know, understanding, trying to speak at meetups and stuff. And then all of a sudden, this opportunity became available and then it came to me. So like in that quote, the career chose me. And like I said, you know, I was curious about developer relations, but there was some decent money in, in Google and I just allowed the career. To. So I, in, in concluding that thread, I said I anchored here. Like when I say I anchored, like 
if you come and drag me, even as I'm learning this machine learning, unless maybe I go into machine learning DevRel, I'm, I'm here for a while, right? Maybe a few more days, a few more weeks, a few more months, but you can let your career choose you. I, I, maybe somewhere much later, especially when you start sorting out some of your basic issues. I mean, from a very Nigerian perspective, that could be to marry, to build house, to buy a car. You can ask, I want to go into freelancing and I want to do ML and AI. I want to build models. I don't want to do, you know, backend stuff. I don't want to do WordPress, CMS, working for this online blog I'm working for. I don't want to do digital marketing anymore. But in, in, in many respects, don't get locked into your sort of like your, your immediate zone or your, your, your box and say, if I don't do this or they don't give me, if I don't see an ML opportunity or a data science perspective, I'm not going to take the leap or I'm not going to, I'm not going to make the move. Um, so yes, I'm going to just scroll through the comments. Um, uh, someone said, how do you maintain? While, while you're scrolling through the comments, Vanelli, I think it's important I say this about letting your career choose you. And that was a very interesting point. And here's, here's what I would say about that. Today at Palta Labs, we don't have an office. Everybody works remotely. Now, I guarantee you that if I didn't spend two years at Andela working, it would have been nearly impossible or super difficult for me to manage a remote team of about 10 people. So when I got into Andela, I mean, I went there with an open mind. I didn't quite understand how my work life and environment was going to be like. But just spending time working with people across different time zones and managing people across you know, diverse um, cultural um, differences just allowed me to know how to manage and work with people remotely. Every now and then when we talk to clients, they're saying, oh, so where's your office? I said, okay, we don't have one. People are always surprised. So how do you get things done? Honestly, if I didn't spend two years at Andela, I guarantee you, it would have been impossible for me to do this. So that, that's a classic example of letting your career choose you. And it's now having a big multiplier effect in your life. Imagine what it costs us just putting an office for 10 people, internet, electricity, all of those resources that we have to do. But then we can now, you know, not worry about that and channel that supposedly resource into library compensation for team members or something. So um, I would say, look, at every point in your life or every point in your career, just go with an open mind and just see what it's there and see how you can make the most out of it. Some of the knowledge that you will learn in some part of your career, you might not see the benefit until two, three years from today. So yes. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. And I'm, I'm going to share a very personal um anecdotes you know attached to this uh, many times when i speak at conferences or i, I give I, I you know i drop the hint that oh god I, i've been fired twice you know i've lost my job twice and um reasons why some of these things have happened is sometimes you find yourself in an uncomfortable position doing things you're not completely comfortable at uh, um, today you know luckily I, I do work at google and and it's all it's not all rosy. I do find myself in uncomfortable situations, either doing a specific task that I'm not very good at doing, or I sort of find boring. Um, trust me. Sometimes I tweet and it sounds like I don't care. I love my job, right? And I don't want to lose my job because I have had that experience, this harrowing career experience of losing my job in two previous. Um, um, iterations. <laughs> let me speak in, in. Let me speak in algorithms. Um, when I find myself in a situation where I don't like what I'm doing, or I'm not comfortable, or it doesn't inspire me, my career path has taught me about the consequences of not being able to adapt to this difficult situation. So I know what the consequences are, and I know how to sort of create this box and do this task, I honestly, honestly, either find very difficult to do or don't know how to do very well, right? But because I have experienced, I, I, I mean, I, I, was, I was talking to a colleague the other day and I'm like, I'm so glad I've had those two previous experiences of working in difficult situations and not being able to adapt and solve those problems because honestly, if I had brought that baggage or that attitude to my current job, I definitely or possibly could have found myself in a very uncomfortable position. So yes, I, I just wanted to buttress your point on letting your career choose you and um, having to be able to, and I really love the direction this conversation has gone. We've got 10 minutes to go. Um, we started with, um, no, you don't need ML or AI. Um, one other disclaimer, 
One other disclaimer that I want to put out here, and this happens a lot in a number of conversations and in a number of my controversial tweets. We seem to not understand the distinction between need and want. So when you say you need something or you want something, it is okay to want ML or AI in your business. It is very okay because you've seen the biggest companies, you're interacting with the most fantastic products, and they do have ML or AI in one specific way or the other. Forget the fact that they have well-defined problems, they have huge amounts of data they've either gone to look for or they already have and they are mining, and they want an AI edge or an ML edge or a data science insight into the problem they're solving or the way they're solving the problem, and then they go ahead and do it. Most times they also do have a lot of the resources that they need to go ahead and solve those problems. But when we say you don't need ML or AI, the emphasis is not the ML or AI, especially the emphasis is the need. Do you need ML or AI or do you just want ML or AI to be in your pitch deck, your buzzword or your CV? So I, I think that is one, I, I really thank God I remember that. That distinction between need and want and being able to understand what is the domain and what is the business problem you're trying to solve. And I think I would, I'm sure you have some comments on this need versus want, because I'm sure you've been often misunderstood either from that article or from the promo flyer for this webinar or in just many different conversations when you're talking about practical software engineering, practical problem solving. Yes, um, yeah, oftentimes people think when you say um, you don't really need something or you don't really want something, it comes from the place where they think you are against that thing. No, it's not. I mean, if it's going to bring incremental benefit to whatever it is that you're doing, um, then do it. And honestly speaking, there are problems where you humanly can't just solve it without either ML or AI, for instance. Like, it's impossible for you to do that. Um, how do you talk to, um, it, to a, a product like Alexa or, um, or Google Home and, you know, it does something for you? Like, you need ML and AI to do those kinds of things. But there are places where, when those ML or AI comes, there is no monumental increase. Um, uh, incremental benefit for you or your business. So in that case, could you have used something else to solve that problem? Yes. I mean, this is a clear example of using a sledgehammer to kill a fly. Like, it's not needed. So that's, that's it's important that people should know. And, and also, this thing has a very massive cost component to it, either in terms of human resources or in terms of infrastructure. I mean, machines that you need to process really massive models are expensive. Whether you're renting it by the minute, by the hour, by the second, or whatever it is, it's expensive. A very strong machine with like um, good GPUs probably will be costing you like two, three thousand dollars per month. And if you need like, let's say three of those machines, that's ten thousand dollars. If you're a small company that has just raised a hundred thousand dollars, are you going to spend one hundred thousand just one AI in your product that has barely has a product market fit? No, not needed. Honestly, that's that's where I'm coming from. But at some point, you know, in future, if you now grow and now have this uh, resources to hire people to do that, machine learning engineers or AI engineers are not cheap. Everybody knows that. So would you want to spend your limited resource on trying to do this because you want to appear fancy? Or would you really want to solve human problems for them? Um, Let's even look at 2020. I doubt if there was a machine learning model or AI that could tell us that for four months in our lives we'd be all locked in. I doubt if there was. So at that point in time, is that AI or machine learning <laughs> in your business? I don't think so. Like, I don't think so. Like, for the first time, I think mm. in my lifetime, mm. humans were locked into their homes, not, not against their will now, but for their own safety and the safety of every other person around them. So... Yeah, it's, do you really need it? Or is it just a nice to have? And if you're raising money and you think your investors want to hear that yeah. fancy but what, you know, just because you want to sound smart. Yeah, yeah it's okay. It's fine. I can't, I can't trick people. But I think one person that you should lie to is yourself.
if you, if you can like every other person, but not yourself. Don't absolutely. Yeah. Ab ab absolutely. So um, I'm going to just do a very brief primer around this. First of all, if you haven't subscribed for either the course or for this webinar series or this YouTube video that eventually I put on, on, on my channel, uh, please look out, look out for that. We will put it up in the comment section or in the description of the video. Um, I would spend some time talking a little bit about the machine learning crash course. Um, I see we have less than six minutes and we're not going to go over time today. Uh, so two things I talked about was we want to answer all your Q&A questions and we'll find the most uh, convenient way. It could be a blog, it could be an FAQ section to say all the questions that have been asked, here are some of the answers. And the second thing we're going to be working on and, you know, volunteers are welcome, is editing these videos into eight minutes, seven minutes, six minutes, seven minute bite-sized reviews or recaps. Uh, because I know that doing a one hour, 15 minute webinar can be very engaging. Uh, watching a one hour, 15 minute video uh, after the webinar has passed might not also be the best or the most optimal thing. So we'll be looking to create, you know, TLDR versions of, of these videos. Um, Google's machine learning crash course uh, is put together a couple of years ago and has just been revamped. Um, I have a short link to that, bit.ly slash LML dash MLCC. You might have noticed that most of the links I try to curate have like an LML component, which is the learning machine learning. Um, there's an interesting section on introduction to machine learning problem framing. And this is really, really very important about how do you articulate your problem so that you can actually define whether or not it is machine learning that will help you solve it. Like, is the tool or the, the techniques, the processes, the, the, the best practices suitable of, of machine learning, suitable to actually solve the problem you've clearly defined? Now, when you solve the problem you've clearly defined, do you even have the data? Can you go gather it? Do you have it? Can you clean it up? Can you, you know, sort of like do all the exploratory data analysis around that data for you to be able to feed it into a machine learning problem process? And then, you know, sort of like build a model around it. And then when you have a model, what do you want as the output? Are you serving predictions of spam, not spam, fraud, not fraud, likelihood to buy, not to buy? Uh, what video are you going to likely watch or which one will you like? Or what sort of playlist can we, uh, um, can, can we curate for you without you having to go and select all the 50 songs you want to hear because you're driving from Lagos to Kano or for, you're going to be on a flight for six hours and you want some films that are similar to a film that you like and stuff like that. So framing a machine learning problem is really very important. And then there are a lot of other steps to that. I, I really urge you to take the Google's machine learning crash course. It, it's, it's sort of easy to, to a point. Um, I, I took it the, the previous version and I know there was a bit of feedback um, and now I'm gonna be trying to take the, the, the new version. Um, so you, 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 you sort of find what you want. And then if you can't get into deep or you, you get to the part where there's some discrete mathematics of some algorithm, there's a lot of pre-work and prerequisites you can refer to that talk about things like what are the basics you need to know about data, about algorithms, and even just the, the whole process of framing a machine learning um, problem. So we've got three minutes, and I'm gonna use those three minutes to try and at least address two questions or two comments here. I hope I get the right one. So Solomon says, um, the interest of the particular area is also very critical. Some people want something that they aren't interested in. Some people are interested in something that they do not need. It's interesting. Thank you, Solomon, for that comment. Um, there was another one from Pizza Balarabi. So with regard to the technology need or want, I personally believe that technology is a tool and not the solution. Um, I'm sure Celestine agrees. Developers should focus on the solution first, then the tool to use, not the other way around. I think you have made we should have just tweeted this and then we wouldn't have been able, we wouldn't have been able to have this webinar. But that's a very beautiful summary, um, Peter. And another one yeah. from Solomon says, um, it's a puzzle. The puzzle can only be solved by understanding the needs and the wants. I did say a question. Yes, and I won't skip this question because I think people really love this. We've got two minutes. On starting your own business, how do you balance between managing business, which is soft activities, and the software development? I don't think managing business is soft activities, but I'll leave that to, to Celestine right now. Um, so, I mean, um, the, the managing business part, I mean, using his language, has to come first. If you don't have business coming in, you're not developing any software. So that's, that has to come first. Um, so you definitely need business to write software. Then also, you need to be able to know how to distinguish between how much time um, you spend 
running the business and how much time you spend writing the software. Um, so for me, I am a night owl. I spend, I go to bed by 4 a.m. every day. So I write software in the night. And in the, in the, the day, I'm prospecting new clients, answering inbound inquiries, and just you know helping team members unblock them. So that's how it works for me. Absolutely perfect. And I want to just thank Celestine for um, the insights and for all the articles you write that, you know, sort of guide us and, you know, sort of set us on the right path. This was a very interesting session. I've seen lots and lots of comments about this being an interesting session. And we are right on time. It's 4 p.m. West African time. We're shutting down. Thank you very much. Goodbye. And see By you next way, week. Um, yes, go ahead. You can tweet at me, and I'm very very happy to answer your questions. Uh, I am at Cybermoon on Twitter, so I'm happy to answer your questions if I can't take them here. So. On Twitter. Bye for now, and possibly see you guys next week. Thank you, Celestine. All right, thanks, Anidhi. Thanks, Bye.